Hi there, I'm Harvest Crittenden. Welcome to my studio. This is Acorn Arts. As I travel and teach, I get so many requests from students to show them how to gild. They all want to know how to use Instacall and how to do some quick gilding methods. And because I teach it so much, I thought that it might be of interest to you, which is a larger audience. So today I'm doing just a brief video to show you what Instacall is, some of the steps and the tools that I use when I am going to do some gilding project and how it can enhance the work that you do. I don't get paid by Instacall. I'm not representing Instacall. It's just something that I use and get asked about quite a bit. So that's the reason for the video. Before I start, I want to show you a lot of the tools that I have here in front of me. And, and I will be showing a lot of things to you under the close-up mode, but before we switch to that, I do want to show you a little bit about what's on my table. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Okay, Instacall is a product. It's an acrylic-based glue that is used to put on paper or calfskin vellum or any other surface for gold leaf to adhere to. And it comes in a bottle that's very similar to this. This is actually Miniatum, which is a related substance. I don't have any of the slightly larger Instacall bottles. I recently bought the very large size because I was traveling over the summer teaching several workshops. So I got this size, which is more economical. When you buy Instacall, I recommend that you buy it in the smallest available size. That's normally about twice the size of this. When you buy it, and once you open it, it's exposed to air. And as with any acrylic medium, it is going to dry out the more it's exposed to air and thicken up. It's not something that you want to have exposed to air for a long time. What I do when I purchase a brand new bottle is I thoroughly mix it. You will see when you get a jar of Instacall that there, are, there is a heavier clay bottom and then there is a lighter glue up on top which needs to be mixed together thoroughly. When you get it, do not shake it. You don't want to introduce air bubbles into the Instacall. So when you get it and you have a fresh bottle, I just take it and rock it back and forth like this until it's gently mixed. Now, if there is still a heavier clay bottom that you can see here, it might have been Instacall that was on a shelf for a little bit longer. So I take something like a micro spatula, which is some, a tool that bookbinders use, and they're extremely handy to use. I have several of them in my studio. I will show you these on close-up mode. Or take the back end of a paintbrush. Don't use the bristles, but just the back end is something to stir it with. Stir it gently until it's thoroughly mixed. Once you do that, I decant it into smaller size bottles. These are little bottles that I get from the container store. They are single drop bottles and they have a little baffle system inside the top of the lid which allows the liquid inside to be dispensed one drop at a time. I do that because I don't want air to get sucked back up into the bottle and start to dry the Instacall I have in here. And because I find it gives me much more control over the amount that I'm using, rather than taking it from a jar, pouring some out into a dish, mixing it up, and then you wind up wasting what you don't use. I will be putting the information with the number on the end of the video. Again, these are from the container store and they're just a single drop bottle. I use them all over my studio for a lot of things. I have several of them with distilled water inside and I have it labeled. I have some with ox gall if I'm using that. I have some with all different kinds of paints or inks if I mix up special batches while I'm working on a series or a program of some kind. So that's Instacall and the reason I decant it into smaller bottles. I normally have about six of these bottles 
I do usually put a little piece of tape on it. I write the date that I decanted it and this can stay fresh. I've gone back and used them two years later and they're still absolutely fine with no problem. There is no way an open jar of Instacol would last for that long a period of time. It thickens up. That's just the nature of it. So it's an initial investment at the beginning, but it saves a lot of purchasing or repurchasing of Instacol when you really don't need a new bottle. You just need to know how to use it a little bit better. Okay, the other things I have around me, I have distilled water. I have a little Dapen dish that I'm going to use as my well to mix the, mix the Instacol in. I have the micro spatula that I've already shown you. I am using 140 pound hot press watercolor paper. That's what I have a lot of samples in front of me here and I will show you these in the close-up mode but these were all done on 140 pound hot press water. I use Artistico by Fabriano. Um, I have mine in a little square pad that comes like this. It's wonderful for traveling if you haven't used these before. This size just happens to be fabulous. I use it for gilded initials quite a bit. I have a water container. I have Q-tips. That's all you need to do your burnishing, a Q-tip. Use a good brand. Don't use the inexpensive brand because what happens is that the stick of paper that's the center will wind up poking through the cotton as you're using it to burnish with it. So buy a good brand of Q-tips. They really do have more cotton on the ends and that comes in quite handy. I have what is not the best quality brush. It's a good student grade brush. It is partially synthetic. Um, this is a synthetic material that we're going to be using and so it's perfectly all right to use a synthetic brush. This one is the size of 10 aught, which is 10 over zero. So it's a fairly small brush. I'm going to be demoing just doing a little half inch square on the paper, so I don't want to use a larger brush. Um, it would be wasteful. It would be more difficult to control it as you're getting into little tiny areas. The gilding that I tend to do tends to be very detailed gilding. I should let you know a little bit of my background in gilding. I have gilded for over 35 years. I've learned the majority of what I know from the framing industry. I used to do gilded nameplates for museums and galleries around the world. They were, you see them in museums, they're on paintings. They're the small wooden nameplates, not the brass ones, but wooden nameplates that were then gilded in 23 karat gold and hand lettered. And I ran that business for almost 20 years. So I gilded almost every day for about 20 years of my life. I would gild in batches while one batch was drying, I'd be lettering the next one. So I have a lot of familiarity with gold and the way that it works, particularly for the framing industry. They use different equipment than calligraphers would use. I did use and do have a gilder's cushion, a gilder's knife. I have, you know, the, the, the brushes to pick it up and float it onto materials. So I do have all that, but I find that for most instances, calligraphers in general just need to know how to use it for small areas. And that's quite a bit of expense to go to if you're not going to use it. So I recommend sticking with the Q-tip and some of these other supplies here. I do have patent gold and I have loose gold. When we get into the close-up mode, I'm going to show you both of those, why one would be used over the other. For most hobbyists, it absolutely does not matter. Use the patent gold. It's much easier to pick up and handle. I'm going to show you a method that I use with loose gold to transfer it, if that's something that appeals to you, and I'll talk about the differences. Um, I have graphics acetate, and again, I will give you the information at the end of the video. It is acetate, looks like this. It's in the nine by 12 size. The most important thing to know about the acetate is the weight of the acetate, 
and that is 0.003. So it's a very thin acetate. I will explain that when I use it as well. You do not need acetate if you're using patent gold. You only need acetate if you're using loose gold. So my water container, some samples to show you, and this, I don't want to forget showing you this. This is called a bridge. It is what artists use to rest their hand on as they're painting. Most bridges that you find are made for artists that are doing oil paintings. Therefore, the bridge can be as much as an inch high and even up to an inch and a half so that it will slide over the top of a canvas. Well, that doesn't work for calligraphers. We need to work very close to our materials. And so Rosemary Buchek's son, Stephen, has started making theirs for calligraphers. I love mine. There's some beautiful different ones that he makes. They come with different stones here so that some are more masculine. This one has a little bit of pink and gold, which I happen to love. So you can get them in all different colors of the stones. Paper and ink art carries them and soon John Neal will be carrying them as well. So I will show you this also on close-up mold. So thanks for joining me. I hope that this is helpful to you. I hope that you find some little tidbits and start using little bits of gold on your materials and the projects that you're working on. I am going to switch modes so that I have the overhead camera and I'll see you back here in a few minutes. Thanks. I'm back here in close-up mode and just I'm going to show you a few of the things where you can get a better look at them. These are a couple of initials that I did in workshops as demonstration pieces. So both of these were done over a two-day period. This particular one is the initial E um, as it shows up in purple and then the background is shell gold and this is Instacall with gold leaf on it. This one I did in a workshop. The squares here are loose gold. The inside is actually fine tech, um, which is I love for just doing quick projects. Um, for something like this, this would not be the same quality that you would get from using powdered gold and mixing it into your own shell gold. But it's something that for most things is really nice and it works beautifully. Here I've got a couple of little areas, I don't know if they'll show up on the camera as reflections, um, where I just have tipped in little tiny bits of gold. There's some down here, here in the center, and then a little bit of gold carried over to this side, just so that it gets that reflective quality on an illuminated initial. Now this piece here was done with gesso. This is on calfskin vellum. When I do an illuminated manuscript piece, I almost always use gesso, simply because I use the materials that are going to be most authentic to the time period that I am working from. So this is with hand ground pigments, um, hand on, on, like I said, calf skin vellum, and then this part here is filled in with gesso, leaf gold, and then tooled into that design. The background here is powdered gold that I make into shell gold. I do float it in. I do do shading on top of the powdered gold. If you're very careful, there's techniques that you can use to do that. So I don't know if that will show up or not. It shows up while I'm looking at it. I don't know if it shows up to the camera. I'm hoping that it does. But we're going to just be looking at something that's a quick and easy method for gilding and adding some gold to small projects. This isn't meant to be an inclusive video on all the different methods of gilding, all the different materials. There's many different ways to do it. Many people have their own preferences. This is simply how I do it and I teach it in my classes. This is the Artistico by Fabriano that I was talking about. It's five by seven, 140 pound here you can see, and here it says hot pressed. You do want something that's incredibly smooth to work with. It comes in a pad like so. 
because gold does not mask what's underneath it. It actually mirrors and reflects out what's underneath it. So you want to have a beautifully smooth surface to work on when you're doing it. This here is the graphics acetate, 9 by 12. 0.003 and it's very important that you get the thinnest weight that you can. I'll explain that when we use it. All right, here I have, I hope that they show up, just lightly in pencil I have done three little boxes that you can see. I'm going to zoom in a little bit see if I can get it closer for you. There. Um, three little boxes just done in pencil. These are a half inch each, so I'm not going to be gilding a large area. When I work with gold or gesso and I am doing a design, I purposely make small breaks in the design so that there is a way to join it from floating two different areas. If you look here, the breaks would have been in this tiny little area here and on the sides so that a seam wouldn't show if the Instacol dried at different rates. Here, obviously in this diaper pattern, it's done in squares and so each square is floated individually and then after the gold is painted or leafed on, I go ahead and paint in the insides. So when you're starting, and right now it doesn't, applying the Instacol is different from how we put the gold on. So I'm just going to show the Instacol and then we'll take a break and I will show you the gold setup. But this is the brush that I'm working with. This is a Raphael brush. It's student grade, so it's not the best Raphael brushes. And I am mistaken, I picked up a brush that's zero rather than 10 aught. I have 10 aught and 20 aught brushes all around my studio, but this particular one that I picked up is size zero. So whenever you're going to be starting with Instacol, you want to start with a damp brush. It's very, very important. The reason is, is that these bristles or hairs don't stop here once they reach the ferrule. They go inside the ferrule at least three-eighths of an inch to half an inch more. So if I were to dip this in a substance and just dip a dry brush into Instacol, what happens is that these bristles here are going to wick up or suck in the Instacol all the way up here into the ferrule. Once that happens, you can throw your brush away. You will never, ever get it out. It doesn't matter what you do, it's not all going to come out and it will start working its way down and you'll get all these tiny little crumbs of things and you don't quite know what they are. It's the little bits that are up here inside the ferrule working their way out and gumming up the bristles and whatever you're using the brush for. So it's important that you start with a damp brush. I will be getting my brush damp here in just a second. Before I do, I want to show you these close-up. This is the little Dapen dish I'm going to be using. This is Instacol that was decanted into one of these small single dropper bottles that I was talking about. And this is just distilled water in here. Now when I am mixing Instacol, I don't mix up much more than what I know I'm going to be using at any particular time. So I'm not going to fill this very far. For this particular use, I have maybe a sixteenth of an inch on the bottom of this tape and dish. It's not a lot. Just enough that I can demo a few things for you. So I put out what I believe I will need for the project that I'm doing. I do not pour it back into the bottle once it's done because I've been dipping my brush in this, I've been using it, I have added some distilled water to it to thin it slightly. So I just, when it's done, I pour out whatever is left over. If I were to cap this, and I do have some caps for these, 
it would stay good for probably one day if I were going back to use it on a second project. I would try and cap it as airtight as possible. So I might have used a different container if I knew I was going to be using it overnight. With the distilled water, I dispense approximately 10 to 15 percent of distilled water into the Instacall. Even if it's new Instacall and very liquid, I still like to introduce a little bit of distilled water. It flows a little bit better and I like the results. I'm just used to using it in that manner. I would not add more than 20 percent distilled water or you're going to lose the tack of the Instacall. If this is you're doing this for a raised Instacall effect. If you're doing it for flat gilding, you can dilute the Instacall by as much as 50%. So here I have mixed it thoroughly. I did not stir it quickly. I was not trying to introduce any air bubbles into it. This is the micro spatula that I was talking about. The ones that I used came from Hollander's bookstore. John Neal also carries them, and I'm sure that Jennifer at Paper and Ink carries them as well. So you can get these. They're wonderfully handy tools because nothing absorbs into them. One has a pointed end, one has a rounded end, and these actually come in handy, which I'll show you when I'm working with the Instacall itself. So I have my Instacall. I have my paper. This is the bridge that I like to use that I was talking about. I'm going to have to zoom back out so you can see it. This is the beautiful bridge that Stephen Buchek made, Rosemary's son. You can see here it's a half an inch high, so it sits one quarter of an inch. This is a quarter of an inch wide, and these feet are a quarter of an inch. So all together, it's raised a quarter of an inch off of the surface, but the total height is one half inch. So it's absolutely perfect for getting into these little areas so that it steadies my hand underneath, and that way when I am floating this in, I have something to rest my hand on and take the weight. Otherwise, I would be using it, if I were doing it this way, my hand itself, this part of my hand, would be directly on the paper even if I cover it with a guard sheet, it's still, when you're using Instacall, it's very easy to run something, your hand through it accidentally and smear it. So I like having this that avoids that altogether. So I am dampening my brush, which you can't see. I'm doing it off screen because my water bucket's too large. And that doesn't mean just dipping it in and pulling it out. You actually need to let it sit for a good 10 seconds to let the water absorb up into the ferrule from these bristles so that you know that this has all got water in it, which means it will not be absorbing the Instacall up into the ferrule. So I have it. It's damp. It's not wet in any way. It's just damp. And I'm going to dip into my Instacall. And what I'm trying to do is get a drop that's about ready to drop off the end. I don't know if this is going to show up on camera or not, but it's got just one drop on the end that's just about ready to come off. That's what I want. I am going to put this near the corner. It's not directly in the corner of my square, but near the corner. And at this point, I'm going to zoom back in again so you can see this a little bit better. Get that out of your way. From this point on, this brush should not touch this paper. The only thing that you are doing is playing with this little puddle here. You are floating Instacall, not painting Instacall. There's a difference. When you float a substance, you are just gently kind of playing with the puddle a little bit, and I'm constantly turning this 
in different directions to make sure that I'm getting a nice good point up into the corner of my square. I am not brushing this on. I am simply teasing this little puddle. This is called floating. Now the same is done with gesso. It's applied in the same way. And if you are using hand ground pigments, those are also floated frequently depending on what the pigment is. Once I've pulled it and I have reached as far as this is going to comfortably pull before my brush feels like it's going to start painting it, which would mean doing brush strokes like this, which I don't want to do. I'm sorry, I'm off camera. I'm going to pick up another small bead so I have another small drop on the end. I am feeding wet into wet not into the dry area. And this will give me enough that I can start to pull this out a little bit. Now I'm still only playing with the puddle. I am not brushing this onto the paper. I hope that it shows up on camera I know students in person can see it. I'm picking up another bead. So I have what is another, almost a full drop, not quite. I'm putting wet into wet. Liquid is self-leveling. And if you take the time to brush wet into wet, you will have a very smooth surface underneath and that is the goal of applying Instacol or gesso. You want it to be as absolutely smooth as you are able to get it. go. That has been floated in. I am going to tilt it slightly. I hope that it shows up on the camera for you. I don't want to tilt it too much or it will run, but I'm hoping that that shows. Let's see if I can get this light closer. There. I'm hoping that this shows that this is completely smooth in its dampness. Okay, it's nice and even because it's liquid and it was completely done at once with just pulling the puddle. That means that this area has the ability to dry down evenly and to leave a nice smooth surface. Now this is going to take anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes to dry. Part of that is dependent on how much distilled water you added to your Instacol. Part of that is dependent on your room temperature if you have fans blowing, if it's a hot day outside, if it's humid and raining, there are a hundred different variables that can affect how long this will take to dry. I've never had any of it take longer than 45 minutes, even in damp conditions. So to be sure in those settings, I would go ahead and wait an hour to an hour and a half. I have gone back and gilded over Instacol up to two days later. Now when I do that, it takes an awful lot of hot air breathing on it to re-dampen or to bring up the tackiness back to the Instacol so that it will take the gold. So I'm going to leave this to dry. You don't need to watch it dry for 45 minutes, so as soon as it does, I'll be back and I'll finish up. Thanks. I am here showing you the different kinds of gold that I will be using today. So I wanted to explain what the difference is between patent gold here on this side and loose gold here on this side. The company that I get all of my gold from is Weyrung and Billmeyer. They are located in Wisconsin. Their phone numbers are here. If you want to pause the player, I will also put their information on the last page 
of the video that I'm showing so that you can see where it is. Urban J. Billmeyer runs the company. He is third generation goldsmith. His family still beats gold and to the best of my knowledge they are the last gold beaters in the United States. I am completely in love with their company. They are very ethical. They work so hard to ensure that you will have a good experience. They know what they're talking about. So you, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to call them and they will help to educate you. And I really do try and give them whatever business I can. I just completely believe in their company. And I also don't get paid by Will Rung, by Wei Rung and Bill Myers. So I need to start getting some sponsorships here. Okay, here we have patent gold. This comes attached to a tissue and looks like this. So it's quite easy to use. You can cut it on the tissue. It will stay on the tissue until you adhere it to something different. For most people that are just doing this as a hobby, they're not worried about doing fine art pieces. This works completely wonderfully. There's no reason to mess around with using loose gold. The price that you pay for having it attached to the tissue is that you use, lose a slight amount of the brilli brilliance yeah, of the gold when it is adhered to the tissue. The static charge is transferred between the tissue and the sheet of gold leaf and it, when you're putting it down and rubbing it with the back of your finger or a burnisher, it will come out ever so slightly duller than if you're using loose gold. So that's patent gold. This is loose gold. I use loose gold quite a bit because that's what I was trained with when I was doing gilding for nameplates. It's what framers use. What I'm going to show you how to do is transfer this sheet of loose gold onto a clear acetate sheet. That is the graphics that I showed you. I took a 9 by 12 piece, I cut it down the center so that I had two halves. I then cut, cut each of those halves into thirds. So this is one-sixth of the page of graphics acetate. Now I used to do this back when I was doing it for wooden nameplates. We would use wax paper to transfer it. We would use all kinds of different things to transfer it. We just used whatever was handy. I happened to pick this up when I used to use it in my studio for other purposes and just cut some up and tried it with the gold. I was very happy with the results. And now there are lots and lots of people who are also have found this at the same time and started using it. So it's become quite popular. It's a little bit more expensive to use because you have the cost of the acetate, but I happen to like working with it in this form and I'll show you why in a minute. So what I have here is exposed is one leaf of loose gold. I am going to take my acetate with the tissue attached. It's so important that the tissue be attached. If this comes, if this acetate comes close to this loose gold without this tissue backing, the static charge will immediately suck it up and it will go right up into the top and create just a big ball of gold leaf. That doesn't help anybody. So what I do is acetate side down, tissue side up. I place this on a 45 degree angle behind. I'm going to try and show you. I, I don't really want to waste a sheet of gold so you're going to have to just trust me on this. But I am at a 45 degree angle behind where the sheet of gold starts. So I'm back over here. I am going to slowly just kind of walk that down. I'm making sure that I have it all. Everything is covered. With my fingers holding it in place, I am peeling the piece of tissue off. Once I remove it, that transfers the static charge to between the acetate and the gold that's underneath. While I am still holding it in the center, I use my finger and I go out in every direction 
making sure that I have nice solid adhesion I go back to where I started I pick up the sheet of acetate and I gently roll it off while this hand is holding this down so that the rest of my sheets of loose gold are protected. When I get a book of loose gold, I do not do all of the sheets in the book at the same time. For me, it's just easier to transfer what I know I'm going to use when I'm going to use it. I then take the tissue and I put it over the back so that I now have a sandwich. This is just like patent gold, except that I'm using clear acetate. On the back is the tissue, and in between is the sheet of actual gold. What I will then do is take some kind of a marker, which I don't have. We'll see if this pen will work. And I write top on what I know is the top side on the acetate, so it would go down in that direction. So when I am ready to use it, I don't necessarily cut off a piece the same way that I do with patent gold. I will take off the tissue on the back and place it over whatever, wherever my Instacall is, knowing that this is the right side up. All right, see you back here in just a moment. I'm back with my square of Instacall and I want to show you what it looks like when it's dry. People have a hard time understanding occasionally if it's dry or not because Instacall is just as shiny when it's dry as it is when it's wet. You can see how reflective it is as I'm moving this piece of um, cardstock here, the hot press watercolor paper back and forth. So it still stays very shiny. There's a couple of ways to tell if it's dry or not. One is that this is a deeper color than it is when it goes on wet. This is more of a mustard color, and this is more of kind of a golden ochre color. It really does deepen a little bit in its intensity when it dries down. The second way to do it is to test it with a finger. However, do not take your finger and put it into the Instacall. What you will do if you do that is get your fingerprint nicely marked right in there. I take my hand, I take the back side, the side part here of my pinky finger. So you don't want to be putting any weight on it. You're simply just touching it lightly. I can get my thumb out of the way. There you go. Like this. Um, to see if it's dry or not, and I can tell by the feel that it's bone dry. You don't have your fingerprints here on the side. I don't press hard. I am simply just very lightly going over the edge of it, so I can tell that that is dried. So now I'm going to take the sheet that I have. I'm now taking the sheet I have of the gold leaf that was loose that I sandwiched in between the acetate and the tissue. I am taking the tissue off of it so that now I simply have, let me zoom back out a little bit here. Um, I simply have the sheet that it is here to the acetate because I wrote the words top on it. I know which side is up. I am going to take it and put it just over where the square is. One of the reasons that I love this method is that you can see exactly where you're putting the gold. So I am just going to put it over the very edge there. I am still holding this up a little bit. I have not laid this entire sheet flat down on the page. I am giving it a good amount of pressure. I can see that it is adhering. I lift straight off and you can see that it has taken up that little bit. This allows me, by having it on the clear acetate rather than on the tissue for patent, it allows me to get into tiny little nooks and crannies and tell exactly where this goes. And because I hold this and tilt it at a slight angle, I know that the gold is not being pressed to any of the other areas that are around it. 
So this is what it looks like. Let me set this aside. Gold is very reflective, so it's a little bit hard to video because it just reflects back off it so much. So the gold is adhered here. Now I haven't done anything at this point other than use my finger to give it a nice push down all around the edges. This is the point where I take my Q-tip. Now it's important again that you use the side of the Q-tip never up on top, always flat on the side. And all I'm going to do is polish this I don't want you to think that I'm actually putting any pressure on it because I'm not. And just by polishing, I'm going to polish half of it to start with. I don't know, there it shows up a little bit. On the half that I have polished with the cotton, it is a mirror gold. It is an absolute mirror finish on it. So there's nothing hard or complicated about it. It's simply knowing the steps to use. Don't be afraid to buy a bottle and use it. Try it. Do exactly what I've done here. Put some squares on a piece of paper and try it. Try it where you live in the different temperatures and humidities and all the different circumstances that you might come under and make a little note on it saying this was, you know, I let this sit for a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, two days, whatever the time allotment is that you let it go and the time of the year and what the weather conditions were. And if you do that, there's no reason why this won't work for you just as beautifully. So I'm going to finish polishing this up. I have a nice reflective shiny gold. That's it. I hope you are just as successful where you are learning how to use Instacall, doing a little bit of gilding. Someday I'll do another video on how to tool the gold and put patterns into it. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Bye.